Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. Hmm. Does that sound like a great place to be or not? <laughs> this particular lesson is lesson number five in that series for July 30th, 2022, entitled, Extreme Heat. That sounds even less fun, doesn't it? But as usual, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Father, God, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word, the revelation that you have made to guide us uh, through all of scripture. Be with us now as we consider some of the challenges in some of these passages in scripture. May we come to understand more clearly what you want of us as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. As we continue our series, consider this. Jim? As the wife of the famous Christian writer, C.S. Lewis, was dying, Lewis wrote, Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not, so there were no, excuse me, though there is no God, God after all, but to, but, <laughs> so, but so this is what God really is, is like. Yeah. Wow. So the challenge isn't whether God exists, but the challenge is what kind of a person is he? Well, and let's look look at what the Bible teaches yeah. or it perpetuates. Uh, written by authors that really didn't have the mind of uh, of God. So what is our picture of God? And I would like to ask you out there, that's the big question. What is your picture of God? How should we respond when things get very difficult? Discouraged? Even desperate? What kind of crucibles would God place us in? What kind of troubles will we face when the time of trouble comes? Carrie? When things become really painful, some of us reject God completely. For others like Lewis, there is the temptation to change our view of God and imagine all sorts of bad things about him. The question is, just how hot can it get, and in brackets, in the crucible, how much heat is God willing to risk putting his people through in order to bring about his ultimate purpose of shaping us into the image of his Son? It comes from Romans 8.29. Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, for July 23. Okay, shaping us into the image of his son. Well, now, if someone just would just ask you, do you want to be like Jesus, and you're a Christian, you would say, wow, that's our goal, sure, no problem. But do you want to go through the trials and the troubles and the problems that Jesus went through? That would be the question. Well, let this mind be in you as in Christ, Philippians uh, 1. Or no, two, excuse me, two, uh, what, five? Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, uh, Romans 3.25, uh, with uh, Jesus' death was to demonstrate that God is righteous. Mm -hmm. Three times it says that. Well, God has created each of us as his child. He regards even Satan as his child, his, his creature. He loves each one of us. So why is it necessary for us to go through hard times on this earth to prepare us for a universe without sin or hardship. The prime example in this lesson is the story of Abraham, as recorded in Genesis 22. That's the story of his going to Mount Moriah with his son and preparing to offer him as a sacrifice to God. And Gordon, can you read us a little bit about that? From the Good News Bible, Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham he called to him, Abraham, and Abraham answered, Yes, here I am. Take your son, God said, your only son Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. There on a mountain that I will show you, offer him as a sacrifice to me. Have you ever asked, ever wondered how God showed him that mountain? I almost asked that <laughs> just before you asked. Okay. Early the next morning, Abraham cut some wood for the sacrifice, loaded his donkey, and took Isaac and two servants with him. They started out for the place that God had told him about. 
on the third day, Abraham saw the place in the distance. And how did he know? Yeah. Then he said to the servant, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and worship, and then we will come back to you. There's a couple of places I like to, things I'd like to notice there. Notice the boy and I will go over there and we will come back to you. Or, may, or maybe just I. <laughs> well, if you go back if you, uh, verse 1 and it says that God did uh, uh, tempt Abraham. Well, that word God in that position is uh, Elohim. Uh -huh. It is not the Lord God or Yahweh, which is down a uh, reference to it later. So it could be a misunderstanding. Uh, it says, uh, where is it, uh, verse Verse 1, it says, God tested Abraham in the uh, good it's news. A, and that word is Elohim. It's not Yahweh. So the question here is, they're all getting ready to go. It's early in the morning. Sarah is not awake yet. Okay? And presumably not many others are awake. Abraham has gotten these other three up and said, we're, we're going on a journey. And they had apparently, according to Ellen White, had done this from time to time. So it wasn't too surprising. And they're, so they're ready to start off and nobody's asking about the lamb? I mean, nobody well, asked it. They did in just a moment. <laughs> well, but that's two days later. Yeah. Go ahead. Verse 6, Abraham made Isaac carry the wood for the sacrifice, and he himself carried a knife and live coals for starting the fire. As they walked along together, Isaac said, Father. He answered, Yes, my son. Isaac said, I see you have the coals and the wood, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham answered, God himself will provide one. Can and I interrupt the, there? We're the, going to talk about this a little bit more later. But the way the Hebrew is worded there is very interesting. It could mean God will provide himself for an answer. Hmm. Okay. That's very interesting. Okay. So, God himself will pro provide one, and the two of them walked on together. Good News Bible. No, no questions about where it would come from or anything like that? Well, it's not recorded. It doesn't mean that Isaac yeah. didn't press him a bit on it. It doesn't mean that Abraham didn't say anything more. Yeah. It's, that's all, we, we have the Reader's Digest condensed version. I see. I, I'm sure that Abraham and Isaac said more than this in that day. <laughs> in those three days even, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, after all, the book of Genesis condenses at least, what, 3,000 years of history and 50 chapters. <laughs> it's hard for us in our day with our morals as Christians to even imagine God asking Abraham to make such a sacrifice. In Abraham's day, this sacrifice, a whole burnt offering, would have been called a holocaust. That's, that's where that term comes from. Now, if I say holocaust today, immediately you're all thinking about what happened in World War II, right? But Holocaust was, if you bring a sacrifice and the whole thing is to be burnt, that's called a Holocaust. As for the whole experience of Abraham, God needed to demonstrate some important principles to the onlooking universe in answer to some of Satan's accusations and questions from the devil, uh, questions that the devil had raised about God. It is clear that God knew exactly what was going to happen all the way through to the end of this experience. Now, we believe that God knows the future. So he instructed Abraham to do this. He knew, God knew exactly what was going to happen every step of the way through to the end and all the way back home again. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Did the angels have any idea? I don't think they read the motives and the mind well, that God does. Well, we're told that they can't read the mind. That's true. But uh, certainly not the mind of God, I'm sure. So the so, question is whether God kind of told the universe, this is what's going to happen. That's or, the question. Or did God keep it to himself? Well, well probably tell them what it, it, God's way is openness. Mm -hmm. He's not in uh, pl playing shell games. And well, but... But this is a specific demonstration, and you can't always give the results at the end. What well, do you got with the book of Job? Yeah. God says, hey, Job, Job, Job is going to hang in there, so... But he still allowed the experiment to go. Of course. 
Well, he, he just it, it, evil has has an awful lot of freedom. How did evil begin? Mm -hmm. If there wasn't freedom, yeah, yeah. So why was it necessary? There are several aspects we need to look at very carefully. One, how did this experience impact Abraham and his faith? Two, because remember, Abraham is considered to be the great example of faith in Scripture. Two, how did Isaac respond, and how did it impact his faith? Three, what were all the people of Israel, as well as all the Christians in our day, supposed to learn from this story? And four, what was the entire onlooking universe supposed to learn? Let us look at an extensive explanation of this experience given by Ellen White. And this is a, absolutely the first time I read this, it just sort of blew me away. Um, notice these words, the agony which he, that is Abraham, endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. Something no in the future. Yes. He's supposed to now understand something in the future. Exactly. No other test could have caused Abraham such torture of soul as did the offering of his son. She suggests in another place that Abraham didn't sleep. They walked three days and two nights, and even during the nights he was pleading with God, you know, are you sure this is necessary anyway? And, I mean, think about it. I am sure that the entire onlooking universe is focused on Abraham right here. I mean, they're... God is doing a test of this guy? What's going on here? Well, um, no other test could have caused Abraham such torture soul as did the offering of his son. God gave his son to a death of agony and shame. The angels who witnessed the humiliation and soul anguish of the Son of God were not permitted to interpose, as in the case of Isaac. There was no voice to cry, it is enough. To save the fallen race, the King of Glory yielded up his life. What stronger proof can be given of the infinite compassion and love of God? Quote, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8, 32. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations, that would be us, but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and of other worlds. The field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. We are the one black spot, and this is where all the action is happening. Because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises, Satan had accused him, and so when, what, when, was, when did God show a lack of faith in God's promises? When did Abraham show a lack of faith in God's promises? Well, he sure, certainly did in Egypt when yes. he told Sarah, you're my sister, aren't you? Yeah. Say you're my sister or they're going to kill me. What else, what other big example do we know about? Well, we know God about Hagar and... Yeah, well, that's all part of the... God had said, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Yeah, okay. He waited 25 years. It's a long time to wait. You start out at 75, and you finally get a son at 100. You know, we're supposed to help God sometimes, aren't we? Well, he was trying. What was, you know, aren't, aren't we supposed to do for ourselves what we can? Well. Abraham was just trying to help mm -hmm. God. Yeah. Just trying to help God. Yeah. Satan had accused him, that is, Abraham, before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and as unworthy of its blessings. God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heaven, to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and to open more fully before them, that would be the angels, the rest of the universe, the plan of salvation. So that tells me that they didn't know what was coming. This is a demonstration. It had been difficult even for the angels to grasp the mystery of redemption, to comprehend that the commander of heaven, the Son of God, must die for guilty man. When the commander was given to a command was given to Abraham to offer up his son, the interest of all heavenly beings was enlisted. <clears throat> there it is right there. With intense earnestness, they watched each step in the fulfillment 
of this command. When to Isaac's question, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham made answer, God will provide himself a lamb. And when the father's hand was stayed as he was about to slay his son, and the ram which God had provided was offered in the place of Isaac, then light was shed upon the mystery of redemption, and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. And of course, 1 Peter 1.12 tells us, let's look at that for just a second. God revealed to these, pro these prophets that their works were it was not for their own benefit, but for, uh, and I'm sorry, I need to go here and do the whole thing. I'm going to just read these, the last sentence. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. So that's what we're talking about. How do the angels understand? When Was God being honest with Abraham when he told him to take his son to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him? He knew what was going to happen, didn't he? God knew. Does God ever ask us to do things that he does not really intend for us to do? I don't it, think. Why, why, would he do, why would he do that? Why would God ask you to do something he doesn't want you to do or anybody else? Well, in this case, he did it for demonstration well, for the that's, universe. that's the way we, many people read it, but there's and, another and they, way to read it. But we, we default and we see the word God and we think that that's, that means the infinite one. Not necessarily. Well, we've got the story of Job coming up, the same story. He asks us to do, to go to, does God, he asks us to go to a place where he never intends for us to go. Is it the actual action that is important or the lesson that God wants to teach us? And, you know, obviously there's more than one way to look at these things. Let's look at, there's more to the story. Based on what we read from Ellen White, the most important part of this whole story was the education of the onlooking universe. There are many aspects of the scripture story that follow this theme. Jim? Ellen White, or EGW, put the plan, plan of redemption at a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when, just before his crucifixion, he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up, shall, will, the earth. If I build, will draw all unto me. John 12, verses 31 and 32. Notice that Ellen White wrote, will draw all unto me rather than will draw all men unto me as in the King James Version. Thus, including the entire onlooking universe by leaving out the words, the added word, men. So in the original, the original Greek, the word men is not there. It was added by translators. And they, it was an attempt to clarify things. Yes. In the words, words of uh, Dr. Bruce Metzger when he explained how Bible translators do their work. And I raised my hand in the back of the room in his lecture and, he, and says, well, maybe if he'd left that word men out, it would have been more in harmony with what Paul says, that, Jesus, that Christ's death was to bring peace to the beings in the heavenly places as well as this earth. It went over like a lead balloon because it just didn't fit their paradigm. He just, he had you know, not. It's in, it's in the Bible. He didn't know how to respond to that one. No. Anyway, the act of Christ in dying for the salvation of men would not only make heaven accessible to men, but was, but before the universe, it would justify God and His servant, excuse me, and His Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the result of sin. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page sixty-eight, paragraph two, two. Page 69. He did, she yeah, did yeah, that in 1890. Yeah. That's he over 100 said, years old. Yeah. He had some pretty important things to prove, didn't he? Some pretty important things to prove. One of the questions that should come to our minds almost immediately is, how did Abraham know that it was God speaking to him and not just a bad dream? Or as Jim says, That's, a, that, it, maybe the devil. Yeah. Of yeah. course, we should ask how are we to know if God is speaking to us? 
Well, the thing is that God showed him the sign later, so he, he must have had something to do well, with Abraham it. Abraham came out of, from a very pagan society. Yeah. And, and, and you don't change, radically change your paradigm uh, because some guru and, and with a nice collar put on the appropriate way yeah. change, uh, says soft but if Abraham, Abraham had been away from pagan society for 45 years by now. But he was still infected and it takes a long time and he, how many people did he have were they all believers that he they were working for him well good question so how long did it take paul to change exactly. his paradigm well it he did it pretty two, rapidly yeah well, well it took him two years of study in the wilderness wasn't it it was longer than that three, three years yeah okay. and it was what, what another t uh, 10 or 12 years before he went out and preached no he he actually well at least yeah. be doing his missionary journey yeah right yeah he went all by himself, kept quiet about it, but he was, tra he was working around Antioch and up to, not too far from his hometown, back and forth up there. He says that later. He says, I had, I actually, most people miss that completely. So those 14 years that we know nothing about, well, what we know about it is when he, go, he comes back later and says, I went through all these shipwrecks, I was beaten, I was da-da-da. Well, when did that happen? Well, that's when it happened. Well, of course, we should ask how we are to know if God is speaking to us. Abraham had no prophet to guide him, no pastor, no Sabbath school class, no church, no fellow Christians to help him, except his immediate group around him. His wife. Yeah. When we think God may be talking to us, are there ways to be sure? Another very interesting story in Scripture on the topic of extreme heat is the story of Hosea. What does God want us to learn from that story? Now. To better understand the story of Hosea, you need to understand that this story, Hosea lived, we don't know exactly, and we can't nail it down to the exact year or something, but a very short time before, and he was in the northern kingdom of Israel, a very short time, maybe just a few years, maybe very few years, before the Assyrians came and conquered that whole nation and scattered them. And if you read the rest of Hosea, I mean, it's like, it's like everybody up in that, in that country was involved in these fertility cult religions. Everybody was, stuff they were doing was. So, in light of that. My turn, I yes. think. Yes. Hosea 1, verses 2 through 8. When the Lord first spoke to Israel through Hosea, he said to Hosea, go and get married. Your wife will be unfaithful and your children will be just like her. In the same way, my people have left me and become unfaithful. Hosea married a woman named Goma, the daughter of Diblaim. After the birth of their first child, a son, the Lord said to Hosea, Name him Jezreel, because it will not be long before I punish the king of Israel for the murders that his, ancient, that his ancestor, rather, Jehu, committed at Jezreel. I'm going to put an end to Jehu's dynasty. And in the valley of Jezreel, I will at that time destroy Israel's military power. Gomer had a second child. This time it was a daughter. Notice it doesn't mention Hosea. Yeah. The Lord said to Hosea, Name her unloved, because I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. But to the people of Judah I will show love. I, the Lord their God, will save them. But I will not do it by war, with swords or bows and arrows or with horses and horsemen. After Goma had weaned her daughter, she became pregnant again and had another son. Still no mention of Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, Name him not my people because the people of Israel are not my people, and I am not their God, from the Good News Bible. Wow. Would, so this would, is a living parable. <clears throat> yeah. Would one of the, it wasn't that God rejected him, they just didn't want him to be, be their God. That's yeah, no, no, absolutely, that. yeah. It was a, a choice on their part. You don't want me, so you know, if you insist on leaving me, I'll let you do what you want, there what you, you insist that, on doing. That is love. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't sound like the way we generally think yeah. of love. Would God really ask one of his faithful prophets to marry a known prostitute or even a woman whom God knew would become a prostitute? 
There's a good question to think about. In light of this story, what was about to happen to the ten northern tribes of Israel? Why did God keep working with the descendants of Abraham? Weren't they just as guilty as a prostitute? Good News Bible from Hosea 2, verse 1 onward. So God, so call your fellow Israelites God's people and loved by the Lord. My children plead with your mother, though she is no longer a wife to me and I am no longer her husband. Plead with her to stop her adultery and prostitution. If she does not, I will strip her as naked as she was on the day she was born. I will make her like a dry and barren land, and she will die of thirst. I will not show mercy to her children. They are the children of a shameless prostitute. She herself said, I will go to my lovers. They give me food and water, wool and linen, olive oil and wine. So I am going to fence her in with thorn bushes. That sounds quite drastic. Real, real love, isn't it? And build a wall to block her way. She will run after her lovers, but will not catch them. She will look for them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I am going back to my first husband. I was better off then than I am now. Would Israel actually think that? Well, Would Israel actually acknowledge that as, as Gomer did? Verse 8, she would acknowledge that I am the one who she gave... She would never acknowledge yeah. She would never acknowledge that I am the one who gave her the corn, the wine, the olive oil, and all the silver and gold that she used in the worship of Baal. So at harvest time, I will take back my gifts of corn and wine and will take away the wool and the linen I gave her for clothing. I will strip her naked in front of her lovers and no one will be able to save her from my power. I will put an end to all her festivities, her annual and monthly festivals, and her Sabbath celebrations, <clears throat> all of her religious meetings. I will destroy her grapevines and her fig trees, which she said her lovers gave her for serving them. I will turn her vineyards and orchards into a wilderness. Wild animals will destroy them. I will punish her for the times that she forgot me when she burnt incense to Baal and put on her jewelry to go chasing after her lovers. The Lord, Yahweh, has spoken. Wow. And what about us? Is God working with us because we are such promising candidates? Or do we always recognize God's hand as he works in our day? You know that Ellen White says repeatedly, a hundred years ago, we should have been in the kingdom before that. When apparently impossible blockades are in our way or big difficulties obstruct our plans, do we assume that God has nothing to do with them? How should we respond when we think maybe God is involved, but we do not like what he's doing? God continued to speak about Hosea and the people among whom he was living in these words, Hosea 2, 15 through 23, she will respond to me there as she did when she was young, when she came from Egypt, then once again she will call me her husband and will no longer call me her Baal. That's, a, that's another world of pagan name for, for husband. I will never let her speak the name of Baal again. Israel, I will, take, I will make you my wife. I will be true and faithful. I will establish my people in the land and make them prosper. I will show love to those who are called unloved and to those who are called not my people. I will say, you are my people and they will answer, you are our God. And very soon after this, what happened? The northern kingdom was scattered, never to be heard from again. Could that be our experience? Another example that we, read to, we need to consider when talking about people who went through difficult times in the Bible is, of course, the story of Job. What were the cause of Job's suffering? What was the cause of Job's suffering? Was it God? Was it chance? Was it Satan? Well, look at these verses. We'll go for what the scripture says. Jim? Job chapter 1, verse 6, to chapter 2, verse 10. When the day came for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked them, asked him, What have you been doing? 
Satan answered, I have been working here and there, roaming around the earth. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on the earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. Let me interrupt for a second. Job was an eyesore for the devil. <laughs> he didn't want to talk about Job. Anyway, go ahead. Satan replied, Would Job worship you if he got nothing for out of it? You have always protected him and his family and everything he owns. You bless everything he does, and you have given him enough cattle to fill the whole country. But now suppose you take away everything he has, he will curse you to your face. All right, the Lord said to Satan, everything he has is in your power, but, do, but you must not hurt Job himself. So Satan left. All of Job's wealth of animals and workers and all of his children were destroyed by the devil with God's permission. Okay. This is in parentheses, of course. Then Job's... Well, that's to, to cut out all the long reading in between. Okay. We, okay. It's a summary. Uh, starting in verse 20. Then, God, excuse me, then Job stood up and tore his clothes in grief. He shaved his head and threw himself face down on the ground. He said, I was born with nothing and I will die with nothing. The Lord gave and now he has taken away. May his name be praised. In spite of everything that had happened, Job j did not sin by blaming God. When the day came for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord again, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked, asked him, where have you been? Satan answered, <laughs> I've been walking up there, up and here, walking there and here, give me, walking here and there, roaming around the world. Did you notice my servant Job, the Lord asked? <laughs> there is no one on the earth as faithful and good as he. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. You persuaded me to let to me you persuaded me to let you attack him for no reason at all, but Job is still as faithful as ever. Satan replied, A person will give up everything in order to stay alive. But now suppose you hurt his body, he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, All right, he is in your power, but do not you're not to kill him. Then Satan left the Lord's presence and made sores break out over all Job's body. I want to interrupt over for Job's just body. a second here. Here's Job. I'm sorry. Here's Satan appearing in the council of heaven. All of his former colleagues are there from all over the universe, all the other onlooking universe for this meeting. And Satan is, Satan is in the bind because they, he knows that Job has been the one man down on earth that he hasn't been able to get to. And now, first time it didn't, you know, uh, everything he did to Job didn't work. And now he's really, he's really in trouble here because, you know, everybody is saying, hey, you, look what you did. What, why haven't you convinced him to, to give up on God yet? Mm hmm I think Satan was kind of hoping that this would just kind of disappear into yes. the background. Yes, no I one's do. going to bring that up. That's, that's was, a small item in the minutes. It's not going was, to come he, up. <laughs> I'm sure he was hoping that nobody would mention Job ever again. Anyway, go ahead. These two ch chapters, by the way, are an example of God's foreknowledge. That mm -hmm. God foretelling the future when he declared that Job was a righteous and upright man. Then Satan left the Lord's presence and made sores break out over all out all over Job's body. Job went and sat by the rubbish heap and took a piece of broken pottery to scrape his sores. His wife said to him, you are, you are still as faithful as ever, aren't you? Why don't you just curse God and die? Job answered, you are talking nonsense. When God sends us something good, we welcome it. How can we complain when he sends us trouble? In spite of everything he suffered, Job said nothing against God from the Good News Bible. Yeah. Now, we, we understand here that in ancient times, the basic idea was whatever comes, it either God sends it or he allows it. Well, that's not just ancient times. That's yeah. the way we read the Bible. Yeah. And I'm not making that up. I'm this story should pose shocking questions to your mind. 
Why was God addressing Satan before the leaders of the onlooking universe and challenging Satan about his servant Job? Satan probably did not want to talk about Job. Job was one of the very few people on this earth who were actually resisting Satan's attacks. There are two very important questions in the story that need to be considered. One, who is responsible for all of Job's sufferings? Now, we, we already read that. And two, was God in any way responsible since God gave permission for Satan to trouble Job? Does that make God responsible even if Satan was personally inflicting the suffering? How many people given an experience like that of Job would it turn against God? On what basis did Job remain faithful to God? I mean, these are the kind of questions that are, we could spend an hour on each one of these. How did he get to know God so well? We have no records of God speaking to Job until after this experience. Of course, in the light of what we know about Abraham, we recognize that it is likely that God has spoken to Job on more than one occasion prior to that time. So, jumping back again, let's draw some conclusions here. Can you read Job 1, 20 to 21 for us? Yes. Well, let, let, let me just pop that up here just to remind us. Then Job stood up and tore his clothes in grief. He shaved his head and threw himself face downwards on the ground. He said, I was born with nothing and I will die with nothing. The Lord gave and now he has taken away. May his name be praised. Okay, so what comments about that from the Bible study guide? Reading from Job chapter 120 through 21 again. In Job 120 and 21, we see three aspects of worship that may help in, when in anguish. First, Job accepts his helplessness and recognizes that he has no claim to anything. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. From Job 121. Second, Job acknowledges that God is still in total control. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. And that's Job 121, New NIV version. Third, Job concludes by reasserting his belief in the righteousness of God. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's Job 121, NIV Adult Sabbath School Bible Study for Tuesday, July 26. So he makes some very clear, pointed statements about the whole experience as bad as it was. So if one is going through a difficult experience, does it help to read the story of Job? Paul also went through an incredible succession of troubles, few of which we know anything about. Second Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of the trouble we had in the province of Asia. The burdens laid upon us were so great and so heavy that we gave up all hope of staying alive. We felt that the death sentence had been passed on us, but this happened so that we should rely not on ourselves, but only on God who raises the dead. Good News Bible. So if it comes to the points where you're looking for somebody to raise somebody from the dead, there's not too many people you can depend upon, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a truism, right? <laughs> yeah. And how did Paul respond to all those troubles? Look at this list of troubles. I mean, just incredible. As we mentioned a few moments ago, these are things we, we, know, we don't know any details about these things except right here in this passage. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I am better servant than they are. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I've been whipped much more, and I have been near death more often. Five, time I, five times I was given the 39 and last, 39 lashes by the Jews. 40 lashes is supposed to kill you. So five times he was given the 39 lashes. When, when was that? We don't know. We don't so have any idea. say 40 save one. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, the 39 is 40 save one. Yeah. Three times I was whipped by the Romans. We don't have any idea when that was. And once I was stoned. Well, maybe we know that story. We know one of, of those. We know one time when he was stoned. And left for dead, by the way. I have been in three shipwrecks. We know nothing about those at all. The shipwreck he was in was much later that we know about. And once I spent 24 hours in the water. In my many travels, I've been in danger from floods and from robbers and danger from fellow Jews and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers in the high seas, and dangers from false friends. Wow. 
there's been work and toil. Often I've gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing. And not to mention other things, every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. That's from the Good News Bible. Well, if you feel like you have been through a lot of difficulties and really extreme crucibles, does that make you more sympathetic and more helpful to others who are struggling when you read a list like that? Have any of us had 40 stripes, same one, as Jim says? Do the examples of Abraham, Job, Hosea, and Paul help us? After considering these four people's experiences, might you develop the idea, the idea that God is a severe, demanding taskmaster? Does God sometimes seem like a bully? There's a question. Paul recognized this possibility, and his words were, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Do you, so you should not pass judgment on anyone before the right time comes. Final judgment must await until the Lord comes. He will bring to light the dark secrets and expose the hidden purposes of people's minds, and then all will receive from God the praise they deserve. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. What we see now is like a dim image in the mirror. When we shall see face to face, what I know now is only partial. Then I will be, excuse me, then it will be complete. As complete is God's knowledge of me. I am so much looking forward to the panorama, as Revelation calls it, when we see. So that's why he did that. So that's why that happened. So we're going we're gonna to have a lot of fun in the first thousand years and probably from then on, seeing all the things that God did. What do these words from Isaiah uh, suggest about how we should respond to the crucibles which God places us? Gary? Reading from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 3. Israel, the Lord who created you, says, Do not be afraid, I will save you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. Can I interrupt there for a second? Uh -huh. He doesn't say you're going to keep you from the deep waters. He says, I'm going to be with you in the deep waters. When you pass through. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, your troubles there? Yeah. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. When you pass through fire, you will not be burnt. Hard, the hard trials that come will not hurt you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy God of Israel who saves you. And that's wow. in the Good News Bible. Uh, Are you comfortable with the different ways God has promised to help those who are going through crucible experiences? <clears throat> Wouldn't we rather have God just save us out of these things? You bet. It is only fair to consider some other verses that talk to us about how God feels about us and our lives. Gordon? Psalms 103, 13 and 14 verses. As a father is kind to his children, so the Lord is kind to those who honor him. Well, he passes through the deep water with you, right? And through the fire. And through the fire. He knows what we are made of. He remembers that we are dust. Matthew 28, 20 says, And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, Every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people, but God keeps his promise and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the same time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. So the crucibles are supposed to harden us, get us- Purify us. Yeah. Oh. Get rid of Pure. the dross. Make <coughs> Settle your mind into a, a position. In the with with uh, what is it? Uh, Pharaoh. They talk about harden his heart. Yeah. But it's really this. this the corollary is, you settle so settled into the truth you can't be moved. And that's yeah. what they call a ceiling in, in Revelation. Or yeah. So settled. Pharaoh was so settled into the falsehood that he right. couldn't be moved. Yeah. Exactly. That that's 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 the way it is. I mean. 
God gives you evidence. Yeah. If we experience life, life experiences, and ultimately you make a, a choice. There's, apparently there's only one <laughs> that's good. The others are yeah. self-destructive. First Peter 1, 7. Their purpose is to prove that your faith is genuine. Even gold, which can be destroyed, is tested by fire. And so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested so that it may endure. Then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. Do you want me to continue with I'm Ellen good White? Enough. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, this is from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets. God has always tried his people in the furnace of affliction. Oh, whoa, whoa, hold on. God has always tried his people in the furnace of affliction? That's what it says. Mm. Okay. It is in the heat of the furnace that the dross is separated from the true gold of the Christian character. Jesus watches the test. He knows what is needed to purify the precious metal, that is us, that it may reflect the radiance of his love. It is by close testing trials, it is by close testing trials that God disciplines his servants. He sees that some have powers which may be used in the advancement of his work, and he puts those persons upon trial. So is it better not to be? If you're not being tested, maybe God doesn't think there's anything worth working on on you. No, that's a scary thought too. Yeah. In his providence, he brings them into positions that test their character. He shows them their weaknesses and teaches them to lean upon him. Thus his object is attained. They are educated, trained, and disciplined, prepared to fulfill the grand purpose of which their powers were given them. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets 129 to 130. Okay, I'll go ahead in there. Another quotation from Melvin White. If in the providence of God we are called upon to endure trials, let us accept the cross and drink the bitter cup, remembering that it is a Father's hand that holds it to our lips. Hmm. Notice Father is in capitalized, is capitalized there. Let us trust Him in the darkness as well as in the day. Can we not believe that He will give us everything that is for our good? Even in, in the night of affliction, how can we refuse to lift heart and voice in grateful praise when we remember the love to us expressed by the cross of Calvary? That's volume five of the Testimonies, 315, 316. Um, I, I think about the disciples when, when I read something like this and their experience. What happened to them between Friday of, fr the crucifixion Friday and we'll give them a few weeks now, six weeks later at Pentecost. What, what changed? Paradigm shift. A paradigm shift. What led to the paradigm shift? Jesus leaving. Well, Jesus leaving and? The Holy Spirit. Decided. They knew, yeah, the Holy Spirit was the one who convinced them of it. Really the bottom line is they said they weren't afraid of death anymore. They were not afraid to die. That's a huge paradigm shift. And why were they not afraid to die? They knew that Jesus had a plan for them beyond death. So I, after I had my heart attack what, almost six years ago, I came up with a little phrase, dying is highly overrated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't know anything for like about at least eight hours. Yeah. A friend of mine, somebody you guys know, uh, he watched it, them do the angioplasty uh, on the uh, on the screen while really? they were doing it to me. I didn't know anything for yeah. oh, ten, eight, ten hours. Have you had some severe crucible experiences in your life that you could share with others showing how God led you through it? Um, crucible experiences can be very educational. No one else in the history of our world has gone through what Jesus Christ went through. We can say that for sure. Think of the final few hour, days of his experience, including from Calvary to the grave. I mean, these, I am sure we're going to spend the rest of eternity seeing these things over and over again and realizing 
what we don't realize usually is we, you know, we usually talk about, okay, here's the scribes and the Pharisees, and here's the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, and the, and the Jewish soldiers probably also, and here's Jesus. What we don't realize, or what we sometimes forget to realize, and we should never, is that the entire universe is glued on what's happening there. Not only all of God and all his followers in the onlooking universe, but Satan and all his group, group are there. They realize this is the crucial battle in the great controversy. <clears throat> Either God's going to win or Satan's going to win. They can't both win. So, I mean, upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. Actually, this is yours, Carrie, isn't it? Upon Christ as our substitute and surely was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. I need to interrupt there for a second. <clears throat> the wrath of God. What do we know about the wrath of God? Well, watch, it's going, to, it's going to tell us in just a moment. The wrath of God against sin. Now, was, was Jesus a sinner? No. Absolutely not. But he was treated as if he were a sinner. And notice what God is going to do. Okay, go ahead. All of his life... Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Okay, now, usually we think of someone gets angry in a human sense, they're attacking, right? And what happens here? God's wrath is expressed because God withdraws. And what did Jesus say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes. Okay, go ahead. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Okay, so let's th think about this for a second. Satan is, I mean, I'm sorry, God in Jesus is so concerned about the fact that he, he, he can't see his presence of the Father. He can't feel the presence of God. And this is a result of sin. All the, all the beatings and, all, and the crown of thorns and so forth, he, he didn't even feel those. All he was concerned about was the fact that sin was separating him from his father. And let me ask you the question, how do you feel when sin separates you from God? Okay? Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish for which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. Wow. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as a man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Okay, let's think about that for a second again. So, he died of what? Separation from God. He didn't die of beating, he didn't die of blood loss. He died of separation from God. Okay? Remember he said, he says, I lay down my life mm -hmm. and I can take it up again. Yep. Yeah. Parallel, you can't kill me. Mm -hmm. yeah. In that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. He makes darkness his pavilion and conceals his glory from human eyes. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. The Father was with his Son. Yet his presence was not revealed. Had his glory flashed forth from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. Wow. 
And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. Presence, rather. He trod the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with him. In the thick darkness, God veiled the last human agony of his Son. All who had seen Christ in his suffering had been convicted of his divinity. Notice that. Very interesting. How many? All who had seen Christ in his suffering. That means the high priest, all the other priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of them. All the people going by, because that was one of the main thoroughfares into Jerusalem, all those people, when they took one look at him, they could never forget what they saw. Plus the onlooking universe. Yeah. Yeah. That face once beheld by humanity was never forgotten. As the face of Cain expressed his guilt as a murderer, so the face of Christ revealed innocence, serenity, benevolence, the image of God. But his accusers would not give heed to the signal of heaven. Through long hours of agony, Christ had been gazed upon by the jeering multitude. Now he was mercifully hidden by the mantle of God. That's Mrs. White's Desire of Ages, page 753 and 1 through 7541. Okay, we're running out of time here. The best, pre best preparation for suffering is looking to the final week of Christ's life on this earth. Think of what he suffered for your sake, for my sake. If Jesus Christ is to be our example, what should we expect as we come closer and closer to Satan's final times of temptation and trouble? This lesson has focused on the lives and experiences of four great examples from the Old, Old and New Testament, actually five. What do you think God has intended that we should learn from these experiences? How much of the education that God intended for us from these experiences was for the benefit of the onlooking universe even more than for us? Well, modern day philosophical ideas are perverting our understanding of God. And people have suggested that evil just has come about because of human things leaving out God completely no idea that it came from heaven. Evil did and does affect nature and so forth. I'm dropping down. Evil is intended to be and actually was perfect without the, from the beginning. So our Bible study guide focuses on what we on this earth are supposed to learn from these experiences. However, Ellen White seemed to suggest the most important is what should be learned about God trying before the onlooking universe. Let's pray. Our kind of loving Father, we have looked at some incredible passages from inspired records, thinking about what Job went through, what Abraham went through, and now especially what Jesus went through. How could we ever complain about anything that happens to us in light of what these three went through? And so we're getting a little better idea of what the crucible is all about. We know that the day is coming. We are told, Jesus himself said, worse is coming than anything that's happened before on this earth. And so, Lord, prepare us for that day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.